So uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. That's a big honor. And uh, in contrast to lots of the other talks you're going to hear, uh, mine is very practical, clinical, and not very academic. I'm just going to give you an overview of, of how I try to manage as best as possible patients with ME-CFS. Uh, how does, where do I have to press for that? Ah, there, the big green button, okay. So uh, my context is I'm a, a neurologist. Uh, I have a practice outside of the hospital. It's a private practice, but uh, in the context of the Austrian social system, people get a partial refund, so it's not completely private. It gives me a look luxury to have more time. I've got one hour for, for, for the first visit, a half an hour for the follow-up visit. I do telemedicine quite, uh, quite often, which is very convenient for many patients. I've been doing this uh, even in pre-pandemic times. Uh, I've seen in the last seven to eight years over a thousand patients with ME-CFS. Uh, there are not many doctors that treat ME-CFS, and so I'm kind of a focal point for that, unfortunately. That's all I do. I miss neurology sometimes. Um, and I have the chance to have this long-term follow-up because some of the patients I, 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 I see, I've, I've known them for four years, five years, so I, I do have a kind of idea what is achievable in principle. The personal bias, uh, the patients that I see, they usually have, to have the symptoms for quite a while, years, months at least, so it's not somebody who has developed them two months ago, so they have had uh, lots of diagnostics, including psychiatry, which makes me very confident in many cases that I don't see a psychiatric problem because even the psychiatrist said it isn't. Uh, most had different treatment trials that includes uh, rehabilitation, that includes uh, uh, psychiatric drugs, and especially before the pandemic, uh, these kind of, of treatments very often led to deterioration. Uh, and so my approach to diagnosis, and I, I, I try to keep it short because, of course, I could talk for hours about that, but uh, basically the most important thing when you see a patient that might have ME-CFS is to evaluate for post-exertion malaise. That's the basic point because if you have post-exertion malaise, that completely changes how, what, what, how you will proceed with these kinds of patients. There are good old history taking. It's a very, like every patient with post-exertion malaise basically tells the same story of deterioration after doing stuff that doesn't resolve with rest and does take for a couple of days, even months, even weeks uh, to resolve. Uh, you can do a questionnaire, the DePaul symptom questionnaire. You can do hand grip testing. There are some very simple ways uh, to evaluate for, for post-exertion malaise. Um, you should, of course, evaluate for differential diagnosis. From, from my neurological point of view, that's mainly neuromuscular diseases like myasthenia gravis or myopathies. But to be honest, those diseases are pretty easily distinguishable usually. And most of the testing has been done before that. You should evaluate for comorbidities. Uh, I will come to those because those are treatable in some cases and can improve uh, the, the situation. Uh, you should evaluate further diagnostics. Um, what I have to say is that chronic illness is expensive uh, when it comes also to diagnostics. Lots of the tests that are theoretically possible, even for MECFS, usually have to be paid for by the patients themselves. And that's why I only order these kind of tests when I would expect some kind of treatment consequence. That's my context outside of a, of a university hospital, so uh, I, I try to think about the cost uh, it will involve for the patients. That might be the tests for viral reactivation, that might be testing for microclots, where positive test result would probably have some therapeutic consequences. Uh, and of course, you have to consider post exertion malaise uh, when you do testing, even doing a standard mag magnetic resonance imaging can lead to PEM. So you have to consider that. Not every diagnostic test is possible for every patient with MECFS. The second Important point is the approach to pacing. This is kind of the, the, the basics of, 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 of treatment for MECFS in my view. It's very individual because not everybody is the same. There are different limits of, uh, the, uh, for the threshold for PEM. Um, what I regularly ask the patients, what happens after you do stuff? Because it's important after time it can change. If, if, if people do gradually get better, they might uh, mistake usual fatigue that you can have after, after you do stuff that goes away after one or two or three hours of rest with post-exertion malaise. So it's always important to, uh, to, to ask what happens. Um, it's important to regularly explain what pacing is all about 
because like with everything, every, every patient with low back pain knows that, uh, that doing exercises regularly is ne necessary, but they don't do it because they forget to do it. So you also have to remind people with MECFS of pacing because it's such a frustrating, <laughs> infuriating concept also for the patients themselves. Uh, and you have to look for rolling PEM, which is a concept that you can have situations where slight exertion over a couple of days then can lead to post-exertion malaise instead of doing just one thing where you uh, have PEM afterwards. And of course, uh, you have to talk about the frustrations that go along with this uh, disease. Uh, pacing is completely counterintuitive. It prohibits people from doing stuff that they really want to do, that they have to do. And that can lead to psychological distress. And this needs to be treated, but it's not the reason for MECFS. And it needs to be treated in a way uh, that's, uh, that's possible in the context of post exertion malaise. There are different comorbidities. They don't equal MECFS, but uh, they offer a chance of treatment, in my opinion. Uh, common morbidity, comorbidities are, for example, dysautonomia or the postural tachycardia syndrome. You sh every, every patient with MECFS should get an Arsalin test or Shellong test or similar. You can do an evaluation with the COMPASS 31 questionnaire. You can do dysautonomia testing like pseudoscan uh, and stuff like that. But also here, there's a lot of uh, anamnesis, basically. Um, small fiber neuropathy is also something that I find very commonly. Uh, if you test uh, sensory modalities, uh, it's usually only the, 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 the thermal, uh, uh, like cold, that, that's not... Uh, Oh, sorry, my English fails me. Uh, they, they don't feel the cold as well as, uh, as they should. Uh, there's also a questionnaire to evaluate. There's quantitative sensory testing uh, where you can uh, measure the thresholds for, for, for sensory perception. You can do the pseudo scan that measures sweating, and you can, of course, do skin biopsy. But so there, is, there are ways to, to, to test for small fiber neuropathy, which can be a reason for dysautonomia, which can be a reason for neuropathic pain. There is the mast cell activation, or in some cases, fulfilling the criteria of mast cell activation syndrome, where you can test for certain markers like tryptase or leukotrienes, and can test for mast cells in biopsies of the gut and the colon, and where you can do a treatment trial with antihistamines. There are immune deficiencies. They're pretty common. Some of them, especially uh, if, if uh, infections uh, are a regular cause for deterioration, if you have IgG subclass deficiencies, then it might be helpful to uh, substitute that with IVIG. Uh, hypermobility is something that's very common. This can also can be evaluated pretty easily clinically uh, and uh, theoretically with genetic testing. And of course, uh, psychological evaluation, but this has to be done by an experienced clinician who, doesn't, uh, who has MECFS in his differentials. Because what happens a lot of the time, if you don't, have, if you don't consider MECFS a real disease, you send people to psychiatrists, they will evaluate that. And if you don't think about MECFS, of course, you won't see MECFS, and then you have somatization disorder or whatever. So it needs to be a psychiatrist uh, experienced in that uh, area. There are treatment options. You can uh, treat orthostatic uh, problems with non-medication stuff or uh, lots of medication. That's too much detail for a short talk, but you can read that all up. Uh, you can use uh, antihistamines or mast cell stabilizers for mast cell activation. Uh, Pyridostigmine is a treatment that I use quite a lot for people with, uh, with uh, signs of, of parasympathetic dysautonomia that can improve uh, lots of symptoms. Transcutaneous vagus stimulation is something that can be tried. Uh, breathing techniques that uh, influence the vegetative nervous system. So this is trial and error, basically. Uh, IVIG in the context of subclass deficiency. Um, for small fiber neuropathy, there is no evidence that IVIG works. But uh, individually, it can work. Uh, there's also case control se uh, series for uh, small fiber neuropathy in the context of post-COVID, where it had an effect. Uh, for the hypermobility, you need specialized physiotherapy. That's very important because hypermobile people, uh, they can deteriorate from regular physiotherapy uh, and adapted psychotherapy. Uh, or if, you, if there is a need for, for antipsychiatric medication, uh, tr the choice of, of medication that might uh, also have an anti-inflammatory effect. I know that there will be uh, talk about off-label treatment so that... Uh, I don't go into detail. I mean, there is no approved treatment for MECFS. We know that. There are off-label treatments that are frequently used, uh, usually with very little evidence. Um, when you use them, you need to be very critical about uh, tolerability and effect to not uh, uh, induce a state of polypharmacy without an effect. Uh, and it, you should document uh, that you have explained what you're doing to your patient. Um, if you're not certain if they have an effect, because sometimes 
there are changes in the, in the disease course even without uh, medication, then it's always a good idea to, to discontinue or, 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 or lower the dosage to see if that leads to deterioration. Uh, if you use uh, different medications, it's always necessary to do that step by step because otherwise you won't know what helps and what uh, causes side effects. Uh, personally, uh, I mean, everything this is like uh, my experience, so none of this is evidence-based, but if I notice that somebody has a gradual, even if it's a very slow, and usually it's just a very slow improvement on a certain medication, then I'm very reluctant to add something else because you always have the chance of side effects. Uh, and the aim of treatment, in my view, is to improve the threshold for PEM. That none of these treatments that we have are miracle cures, but they can help uh, to increase uh, the functioning and, and uh, insofar reduce the chance of post-exertion malaise. And they are cheap drugs with a known safety profile. Um, this is from uh, the CCCFS study from Vienna that Professor Untersmeyer did and where I also participated. Uh, it's just a patient questionnaire where they asked patients what kind of drugs worked for them. And you see that, for example, low-dose nitrexone, about 50%, uh, pyridostigmine, around 40%. And interestingly, there's a new study that's a preprint from the United States, around 4,000 patients, and they find pretty similar uh, percentages. So it's interesting. Uh, there are, not everybody responds to everything, but it, it's worth trying, basically. <laughs> that's my message here. Um, and the last point is the approach to social issues. Uh, lots of patients have, they can't work, so they need some kind of social security. I always very thoroughly try to document uh, the, the, the functional impairments. Uh, I use the FunCap a lot. I think it's a great tool also to, to, to measure um, the, how it develops, because you can do it at different time points, and you can see if people get better or worse. Uh, you should evaluate uh, like stuff like wheelchair or adapted housing, just to make life easier for the, for the people, to save energy, basically. Uh, evaluation of care assistance, especially in the very severe cases. Uh, and so my conclusions, uh, there are treatments that, are, that can have a positive effect. There are comorbidities that can offer a pathway to treatment. Uh, small changes, small effects can make big changes in quality of life. I think that's very important here. Carmen mentioned therapeutic nihilism. Uh, that's exactly my point of view. You can make a difference even if you can't cure somebody at the moment. Um, and you have to consider diagnostics and treatments uh, also with a view on, on post-exertion malaise and also the cost for the patient. So um, if you want to know more about what we do in Austria, there are some webinars that are freely accessible uh, about neurological aspects, about um, uh, also like how to differentiate from psychiatric disease. Uh, there's a third one that will be hopefully added soon uh, with post-exertion malaise and immunological aspects. And uh, we also have a biobank in Vienna, thanks to Professor Untersmeyer, and I have the honor of being one of two neurologists that will be sending, or is sending patients there, so we hope we can contribute here to research as well. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for a practical side and empathetic side too. So questions from the audience? Yes, there's one question up there. You know, great, great overview. Uh, I was just wondering if you uh, give any advice on nutrition or diet. Huh. That's a very good question. Uh, basically, I think there is no, not one recommendation that fits everybody. What's very easy to observe, that there are lots of intoler intolerances to food uh, that sometimes develop after, after the disease course starts. So my very pragmatic approach is just see what helps you. Basically, and of course, uh, anti-inflammatory food like like uh, vegetable-based uh, uh, food and, and and the reduction of carbohydrates can be helpful, but it's very individual, unfortunately. Is so Rob Wurst here in front? Yeah, very nice, uh, very nice presentation. I'm wondering about your hypermobility um, um, comments that you made uh, that there is maybe something to do with uh, genetic factors. Mm -hmm. But I, can you explain a little bit more what you mean with that, or can and can any patients uh, get this hypermobility phenotype? Um, I don't know, to be honest. It's just very observable from clinical practice that lots of patients are hypermobile and lots of patients fulfill the diagnostic criteria for, for hypermobile elastanlos. I think it, there is a phenotype of people that already had hypermobility since their youth, where they basically first mainly had uh, joint problems uh, that. Uh, 
where they develop uh, different symptoms in the course of their lives, but, but I don't know really. And of course, there are these patients that really noticed that after they had this infection, their joints started to get more mobile, that their, their, their skin gets more lax. So, I mean, the, 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 there's bound to be some inflammatory or a, a matrix metalloprotease influence or whatever that, that, that causes that. I don't know, I'm just a clinician. <laughs> Thanks. There's one question up there. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. I was wondering, you mentioned that you use the hand grip strength in the assessment of PEM. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on how you practically proceed. Well, the, the, the thing is you need the time because you need to do it before you see the patients and then afterwards. And there is the study from the Charité where it's explained it's a, a very cheap I bought the same one that you used at 35 euros on Amazon. Uh, and uh, I mean, of course, you can buy a 350 euros hand grip strength uh, thing as well. But you just let the patients repeat that for 10 times before. And then after one hour, you do that same thing again. And, and you see that the hand grip is, is less uh, after one hour than it was at the beginning. So you simply compare uh, the first session to the yeah. session? Yeah, basically that's. Yeah, that's a hint in the, in the whole context. I mean, there is no diagnostics without the clinical context, but in the clinical context, I think that's a, a pretty good test. Thank you. Okay, I think we have to stop at this point. Thank you very much. Point.